Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm here tonight with Sanford Owen, co-owner and co-founder of Monterey Bay Knives. Uh, Sanford, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. So uh, Monterey Bay Knives, uh, you popped onto my screen uh, about two years ago. I think that's about as long as you've been around. Is that right? Yeah, it's um, physically, yes. So the idea has been around since 2017, and and we started prototyping um, about then. But um, things didn't come into fruition. About, about two years, yeah, you're, you're on it. Okay, so Monterey Bay Knives, you know them for these beautiful, sleek, uh, mostly up until now Ray Laconico designed uh, titanium frame lock uh, beauties and uh, a lot of uh, EDC numbers and then uh, a couple recently that have gone larger. And uh, now you are also uh, um, doing collaborations uh, a little bit further afield than Ray. Uh, tell me how how you partnered up with Ray Laconico and how um, Monterey Bay Knives got started. Um, Ray and I have been, we've been tight for a long time. You know, um, I met him, he came, he came into my, my actual storefront and um, you know, we just, we just kind of hit it off as buddies and, and we have a lot of mutual friends in the, in, in the industry. And um, you know, we go to a lot of trade shows together and, and oftentimes we travel together and um you know, it kind of started off uh, a while back. I, I did a, a an exclusive with Kaiser, uh, the Ursa Minor, and that mm -hmm. was um, it was just a Kaiser knife, and, and and it was it was Ray's design, and and I had approached Ray. I said, hey, um, you know, um, I think I think this would be fun. You know, I, I think it'd be fun to do a an, an exclusive for my shop because yeah, dude, go for it. You know, rock and roll it, and um, and I did, and and it was it was good, and. And, um, you know, eventually let the design go because it was, you know, it was, it was bigger than I was, you know, it was, it was really, you know, it's a really handsome design and, and I didn't want to stunt that for Ray. Um, but it was, it was fun and it was a good learning experience. So a couple of years later, uh, we're, we're doing a couple projects and, and, um, you know, I was selling a lot of Ray's customs through my shop and, and, uh, we just kept having this, this feeling like I just want to do something more and big and, and, and a little different. So I was talking to Ray about it and, and said, well, why don't we, why don't we do this ourselves? Like why, why have a, a company, you know, put their name on it and, you know, slap a big billboard and, and everything like that when, um, you know, when we had the option to, to do it ourselves. And, and so we tried that, you know, we, we, um, we had a good relationship with Kaiser and we went back to Kaiser and we said, Hey, um, this is a new model. And, um, but we, we just, we want it for us. We don't, you know, we want control of everything, you know, every aspect of this and, and uh, they granted that to us, um, which is really nice of them. And um, uh, during that, we, we, we had already started a second project and started working on a third project and it just kind of spiraled out of control. You know, it, it <laughs> went, you know, it just kept going and going. And so let's back up. Uh, you said your knife shop. Now, where I'm from, there's no such thing anymore as a <laughs> knife shop. So it's uh, it just sounds great to hear. But yeah, I know you're in uh, Carmel, California, a beautiful place, and you have a knife shop. That's like a, a double win. Tell me about Carmel Cutlery. Tell me what it's like running a knife shop and uh, and then the moxie you developed to, to start your own actual knife company. Right. Um, so... <laughs> that that still stands true there there still are knife shops um they they they're they're long and gone and and uh there's four or five that i can think of and um so the shop the shop was existed prior to me it was it was a it was an existing business it had been around for 20 years and the prior owners were you know well into their 70s and and um and two, 2008 hit with a bad economy and they were going to close the doors and um excuse me i'm sorry let me see if i can stop this there we go um you know that that came through and and um i was able to uh, procure the, the 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 money to pretty much buy the inventory and turnkey the whole thing so um, you know, I floated through that and, um, you know, and, and it's good, you know, it's, it's, it's did the sense of time. So were you the guy hanging out at the knife shop all the time? And they're like, ah, I don't know, Sanford, we're going to have to close shop. And you're like, oh, uh, I think we're going to have to buy this place. Yeah, it was basically that, you know, I had, I had two places, the haunt, I had the, uh, I had the knife shop and I had the, uh, the army surplus store at the opposite, <laughs> the opposite end. <laughs> right. Right. You have to have your, your backup guy, right? Yeah, for sure. Exactly. So uh, taking over Carmel Cutlery, uh, 
was it what you expected? What's it like running retail for knives when, uh, when um, you know, there's so many online resources? Um, that's where you have to be different and provide a service. And, and that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that, you know, it's like buying shoes. You know, I'm, I'm really amazed that people buy certain items without holding it in your hand. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, so that's, that's tough. I think that's tough for a lot of people. Um, but as for, as for uh, running a knife shop, I think it's like any kind of, you know, um, specialty or, or hobby shop. I mean, it's just the, it's a place to hang out. You know, I've got the same three or four people that show up to the shop every single day of their life. And I have really loyal customers and great people and, and, you know, it's good. So uh, with Monterey Bay knives, uh, you, you have a partnership now uh, with Ray Laconico and you got, you got the company going. What, what is the, um, What's the presiding philosophy through your knives? What do you want these things to be? For the for MBK? Yeah, for the for the knives that you make under that that shingle. Well, um, I like having control of the product. Uh, Ray and I do. We like being able to do small batches and change them as needed, or you know, make them bigger or smaller, or change the handle material or anything like that. And um, and I really like the, I, I, I really like that I can have a, an attention to detail um, and listen to my customer base and, and change things accordingly. Cause that's, you know, it, it feels like, you know, that's, that's where some of my, exp I don't want to call it expertise. That's where some of my, uh, my knowledge for, for some of this has come around was owning the knife shop and, and handling every single knife on the market. And I got to experience that and, um, list of my customers and, and really trying to tune in what people want. And, you know, I'm, of course, I'm, that will be a lifetime goal to keep fine tuning that, but, um, but that's really the goal. So the goal is to stay nimble, uh, but also um, uh, to infuse, I would imagine what you find ideal in, in these knives into the Monterey Bay knives or to, you know, crystallize all those best qualities. What, what are those qualities to you? Uh, fin finish is important materials value. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's important that all these, all these little small nuances and details are important for knives. It's just like, it's like any other big hobby, like, you know, pens or watches or cars, you know, everything matters and that's important. Um, and if I could focus on the, those details, it's, it, I think it could really carry me and, and, and the company and, um, taking it taking it to that levels uh, you know attention to detail to that level is important i think as long as i could as long as i could possibly do it you know i mean when i get a batch of two or three hundred pieces i i do my absolute best at quality control every single piece every single piece that a customer has had i've touched i've seen it i've, I've flicked it open at least five or seven times and you know that's cool so uh, the one that's on my list is the XLC. To sure. me, that is, uh, I mean, I, I, am, I, I have to say I'm not a huge fan of drop point blades. They're not very dramatic to me, but something about uh, Ray Laconico's drop points are so perfect and beautiful. Uh, that, uh, uh, and then you add that simple neutral uh, handle, and it just looks like an ideal design. Uh, and the XLC is right in my size range. What, what sure. made you go to the larger size um that was just simply for fun um we knew that the the ezc that is that is the kind of the goldilocks zone for a lot of edc carrying and and sizing and, and everything like that and and i just thought you know how cool it would be to do something larger and and why not and um that's kind of part of the fun of mbk is is because it's smaller batches it's not it's not the biggest commitment in the world you know it's not you know, it's not a break or make or break commitment. And so, um, you know, if, if I'm not having fun, I don't want to do this. All right. Right. I, I noticed, uh, the Peter Carey and Jerry McGinnis, uh, uh, collaborations, which are both, uh, kind of new are also in that range, that size range, which is, uh, good and bad because they're sure. tempting because to me, once it's three and a half inches or larger, it's, it's, it's suddenly kind of in my realm of possibility, uh, below that I can, I can sort of uh, write them off in my mind just to make it easier for myself. Sure. Right, uh, right. And the, the McGinnis knives. Oh my God. Uh, those are fun. Yeah. 
yeah, those are beautiful. The recurves and, and, uh, uh, yeah. And Peter Carey is, a, I'm a long time fan of his designs too. And that one is kind of, uh, looks kind of unusual for him with that very long slender pokey blade. Right. Yeah. That's something, uh, that's something I don't normally see on the production knife market and I really wanted to do it. I, I, you know, I know it's not for everybody, but I know, um, you know, I know, I know some people would really, really enjoy it. And it's got that beautiful hollow, hollow ground blade, uh, yeah. which is also kind of becoming more and more rare. Um, so what about you? Were you always a, a knife guy, always a knife nut? And, and uh, that's how you got into this. I mean, what are your, what are your real uh, feelings about the industry? And we're like, where do you want to be? Do you make knives yourself? Um, I dabble. Um, nothing handsome enough that I'll ever show you. Um, <laughs> But uh, I like to go to flea markets and purchase old chef knives and doll them up. And, you know, that's what I have in my kitchen. Um, as for being into pocket knives, you know, I grew up on a kiwi orchard, uh, kiwi and avocados. And my grandpa gave me a pocket knife long before I probably should have had a pocket knife. And um, when when I was growing up, pocket knives were a thing. But when I when I was growing up, pocket knives were cold steels and Kershaw's and Emerson design bench maids and you know a lot of things I couldn't afford and um you know old case knives and that kind of thing like that's that's kind of a staple for me there so the working knife that your grandfather gave you to work on the uh, kiwi orchard what was that and and how did what did you use it for uh that was I uh, it wasn't it wasn't even truly a pocket knife it was um it was an old either chicago cutlery or uh gosh what's that other brand um they're just basic wood handle pairing mm -hmm. knife you know prob probably something he found in his in a drawer in the garage you know? and that was your uh that was your standby and uh so you learn the value of the knife from a from a young age you start hanging out at a knife shop you meet ray laconico uh what what's what is your affinity for his designs what is it about uh what he makes that draws you in um, you know, I think that's, I think that I think I could answer for everybody with this, but he can take a really simple design and, um, cause I hate, I hate saying that his designs are simple because a lot of people do. And, and I think they are, I think they are simple in nature, but he could take a really straight lined, clean, you know, without adding all the bells and whistles and make it work. You know, um, I think a lot of knife designs, you know, depend on, you know, all these little intricate little nuances and details and and this guy can throw a fuller on a knife and it just it's just like dude how'd you think of that <laughs> so how how have you seen his designs uh kind of mature or or evolve since you and he have had a, a back and forth a creative back and forth um i don't know i don't i, I think they've i don't want to say that they've they've stood still or anything like that but he just has his own design and his own features that they they just are you know i don't know if they necessarily evolve or but i i do know that i i, I see a lot of, a lot of knives on the market that are influenced by his stuff mm -hmm. and um maybe maybe some of that has evolved that way or um i don't but working with him is good working with him is really nice where I, he and i can talk back and forth about what works and what doesn't work and hey here's a harebrained idea and he's like like nine out of ten times he's like dude i thought the exact same thing so it feels like we're on the same page a lot so I, to me he takes something that's regular we'll we'll say a drop point because i already mentioned it his drop points to me are very beautiful whereas most drop points just look functional to me um but but just something very subtle in his lines the min pin he took a clip point or a Bowie style blade and just with some very, very subtle uh, tweaks, turned it into something very unique, uh, but but not weird. And I always thought the min pin would also make a, a great larger knife, kind of like the XLC uh, treatment. Yeah, fun, fun thing is that we are currently working on that. That is a hmm. prototype in the works and uh, we're calling it the pincher and it will be, um, I think it's be really fun. Um, I think you'll like it. I, I, it, I, it sounds like I will. <laughs> so what's it like working with, uh, Peter Carey or Jerry McGinnis? They're both great. Um, both of these guys are excellent knife makers and, uh, yeah. they're, 
they're the good old boys, you know, they're just honest, easy going, really hard work and really cool designs. When I work with them, it's, you know, it's, um, you know, every, everything MBK is relationship based. You know, I, I haven't ever really gone out and, and shoulder tapped, um, a designer and say, Hey man, I just, you know, I want to, I want to work with you. I want to, I don't know you, but I want your design kind of thing. It, it's been more like, you know, Hey, I've, I, you know, we've seen each other for a couple of years at these knife conventions and this is a thing I'm doing. Um, what do you think? And, and, you know, they're like, well, let's see a prototype. And, um, we prototype it, they check it out. They like it. You know, we, all of us, you know, we, you know, we, we go through the list of what needs to be done, what needs to be changed. And uh, at the end of the day, the day they green light it and, um, and we go. So they're, they're fun. They're easy to work with. And, and I'm, I'm really, um, you know, I'm blessed. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's some legends right there. Obviously they, they trust you not only in, uh, you know, the execution, but that there will be some, um, kind of classy marketing behind it. And that's something about Monterey Bay knives. It, 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 it has a little mystique behind it because, um, things come out in limited batches. They're, they're, um, simple, clean, classy, <laughs> classy. Yeah. That's one of my favorite, it, you know, it's kind of a, a cheesy adjective for a knife, but you know what I'm talking about when you look at, yeah. at the, at the easy C for instance, sure. um, that seems to kind of be your, uh, uh, you know, your, your niche there. Um, so designs come in or you choose a design, things are manufactured overseas over here. How does that work? They are overseas. Um, currently, um, we are, um, I'll, I'll go into that in a second. Um, so I, I work overseas with a few different factories, uh, but ultimately it boils down to one gentleman I work with overseas who has the connections to these factories. I, I guess I would think of him as a broker or an agent um, who I talk to on a daily basis. Um, I'm up at three or 4 AM every single day. Um, I just, I don't sleep. I, <laughs> I, I am up 24 seven and I talk to him about everything, every process that happens as it's happening, he'll take a video or a picture and he'll show me three or four different variants and then we'll, we'll select it there. So it's not like we're waiting, you know, through emails, you know, I'm, we're, we're direct all the time. And I have a really good relationship with him and, and, uh, and a business relationship with these factories. And it depends on what we're, what we're manufacturing, the price point we're manufacturing them. And sometimes I'll pick, sometimes I'll pick this factory for this process and this pro process over here and we'll, and we'll get it done. Um, and, um, and they do a really good job, I think. Uh, as for bringing it here to the States, that's something, um, trying to keep a lid on it, but why not? I'll just put it out there that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in the process of, of putting up a metal building. I'm, we want to start putting up a shop, looking at, um, you know, a Haas machine and, and doing at least one model here in the U S. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen, but it's, it's a big want for us. Oh yeah. I mean, I, cause one of the questions I was going to ask is, uh, what it's like, you know, you, you're, you are one of the lucky few who has a hands-on, uh, brick and mortar knife business. Um, and to go from that extreme to the extreme of dealing with a company on the other side of the planet. And I know with a uh, video chat and all that, you, you can get as close as you can get that way. Uh, but right. you know, you're not, you're not touching it, not, not feeling it. And, and, uh, but I mean, with trusted companies and trusted uh, manufacturers, you know, you know, you're going to get some level of quality back, but, but I could see how you would want to, um, you know, have some, you know, at least be making something here to start feeling it and start getting your, your, your hands into it. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I do that to an extent with, um, you know, with the CAD files and I have a 3d printer here so I can, oh, nice. I can at least print out what, you know, an idea of, of what I'm looking at, but you're right. I, I do. We do really want something that we can take a piece of raw material and have a, a tangible usable tool. And that would be, that'd be wonderful. Um, you know, that's such a goal. So do you find CAD is like the international language? Like besides love, it's CAD. You can send that, that to it's, them. They're like, yes, we know exactly what you mean. Yeah, basically, yeah. Universal languages are, are love and math. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> CAD is, CAD's way up there. 
So is there is there much back and forth, uh, or or when you hand uh, a company or a trusted manufacturer a CAD file, do they is it pretty much plug and play? Like how does that? Um, actually, I I don't do the CAD myself. These guys are these engineers overseas are, man, knives are are child's play to them. You know the they're they're very educated and very talented, and uh, a lot of the times we're you know, we'll, sometimes we'll throw a 3d drawing out there. Sometimes we'll supply a physical prototype, you know, a sample, like a custom from Ray, mm. um, like the VLD. I actually, you know, I actually sent a, a real VLD to the factory. Um, that's you know, the carry model. Yeah. That's the carry model. And, um, yeah, same thing with the McGinnis model, same thing with the first couple of Conicos. but now that our language is, is, you know, now we all understand each other and they are expecting our, you know, our quality and our fit and finish and our, um, our design, um, direction that now we could pretty much just submit, you know, 2d drawings of, you know, of what these things are and, um, and get really, really close. And if they're not close enough, we can change that after prototyping. Do you think, uh, these companies, these manufacturers, um, get to know different companies. Uh, oh, this is a Monterey Bay knife. So yeah, uh, get your best guys on this one. And then the other guys, oh, they don't care as much. So just uh, put the late <laughs> night shift on. Um, I could see that. Uh, but these, these factories in, in Yangjiang are different. They're, um, they are, um, you know, uh, if I were to go and ask for a batch of, I don't know, 3000 pieces, it would be an ordeal for them. You know, it's, okay. it's, yeah, you know, like, you know, if I'm like, hey, man, I need, you know, there's not much of a difference between like two and 500 pieces, but I, I certainly couldn't go and ask them to do 20,000 pieces. I, you just, you couldn't do that. Right, right. Yeah. So are you, um, is Monterey Bay Knives exclusively a folding knife company, would you say? No, no, we're, we're looking at a, a fixed blade. In fact, that's probably... Um, going to be our first U.S. production if and when we get there is um, we'll probably look at a fixed blade first. Um, we definitely want to do an import fixed blade. Um, we just know that the the market and the community for fixed blades is much smaller yeah. um, than than the folding. So what's the what what sort of uh, use fixed blade would you would it be a camp knife or a sort of an EDC pocket fixed blade neck knife kind of thing? What do you? Uh, it definitely a camp knife where we're big on outdoor stuff. We like backpacking. We like four wheeling. We like, we like that stuff, you know? Yeah. So, um, what, what is the knife, uh, community, not the community, but, uh, what's it like being in knives in California? It's kind of a, a polarized issue, isn't it? Uh, uh, it's not the easiest place, is it? Um, for automatics, it's, it's not, um, we're, we're really restricted on automatics, but as far as flipper flippers and, and, and it length restrictions were pretty surprisingly pretty lenient. Um, we'd be surprised considering we're in California. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what about a lifestyle? What about like, what, what, um, what place do you see knives having in our lives? Okay. You and I, maybe, I don't know. We're going to talk about this. I'm a collector. Um, you know, I, uh, my collection of knives is, has gone beyond the rational or, or the necessary for sure. Right. Uh, so sure. I'm a, I am that case. That's an extreme case. Uh, but yeah. who do you make your knives for and, and, and what place in, in our modern day society do you think, uh, pocket knives have? Um, you know, I think um, I think it should still be an everyday tool. I think it's starting to come back around that that um, you know, grandpa carried a knife, and and his grandfather before that carried a pocket knife, and you know, then we went through this full generation of like taboo and no one carrying knives, and um, and ideally, I'd I originally MBK was you know we were building um we we're building knives for the fans of particular designers but i think it's kind of starting to go past that and 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 i i get these this customer base that are just interested in the the designs not necessarily the designers all the time you know mm -hmm. you know a lot of times you know i'd say probably half the time it's it's you know wow i really really like this peter carey model or i really like this laconico model and and, and I heard about it because I am a fan of that designer, but now we're getting, you know, now that we're getting customers that are just like, you know, 
I, I don't know who these people are, but I love this knife. Mm-hmm. You know, that's cool. Well, so who, who are you a fan of uh, knife wise? Do you, do you have a collection yourself? I know you have a whole store, but I mean, do you have a collection and who do you love? You know, I've, I, I've had to separate a lot of that stuff. I, 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 I do have a collection, but it's, it's kind of, I've kind of tail it, tailored it down. Um, I'm a, you know, I like a lot of the old school stuff. I, I, I have, um, you know, I have an original Bob Lum. I, mm. I'm always on the hunt for, you know, uh, a Loveless. You know, I, I love, you know, Jimmy Lyle stuff. You know, I really like these old fixed blade cool stuff. And th- those are, those are, that's like, that's my flavor. Um, Jimmy Lyle, you know, the, uh, the original Rambo knife. Like the Rambo, if you, yeah, if you, yeah. if you didn't get into knives because of Rambo, like, I don't, <laughs> like yeah. you're, you're in a different, different generation than I am, I guess, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but there are there are a lot of makers, um, you know, a lot of production knives I really like. You know, I, I grew up really liking um, Benchmades and Spydercos. And like I mentioned, Cold Steel earlier. I mean, when I was, you know, I'm a young man, but when I was when I was a kid, Cold Steels were the coolest thing. They were <laughs> there was not much cooler than a Cold Steel at the time. Like that was I, I, I think it must be about the age because I'm an old man. And when I was a, a teenager, <laughs> they were also very cool. <laughs> they were so cool, you know? Um, so, I, you know, I have, I have a big appreciation appreciation for that. I, you know, I, this is one of my daily drivers is just a single bladed Victorinox. Like I'm, hmm. I'm super simple. Like, I mean, what else do I have? I've got some, you know, I mean, I, you know, I've got my own personal VLD in hand and, you know, I, I, I enjoy these things, but I think this thing as, as for being a collector myself, um, it's just what I like, you know, it's just, you know, uh, an old case or, uh, you know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you attach, maybe you attach memory to some of these things. Um, and, and since I've started this podcast and spoken to, uh, interesting people such as yourself, I've gone out and bought their knives and then, and then I can't get rid of them. Cause I'm like, well, I had a great conversation with this person and, it, <laughs> and now it has meaning, you know, can't get rid of a gift knife. Um, sure. so, uh, what do you think it is that, that attracts people, uh, to knives, you know, just whether or not they know the brand or, or have any interest in the quality. Right. Um, man's first tool you know other than just crushing stuff with a rock i mean if i mean that's just that's just so primitive i mean it's like liking fire you know it's just been here for so long you know yeah and it's like culturally identifiable like every culture like every everybody you know it's it's just been here um you know my my thing just you know a knife growing up was you had to have one, you know, you just, it, it was, you used it every single day. So what, what is your ideal knife? What, when will you hang it up? Like, okay, I've, we've made uh, the Monterey Bay knife that just takes the cake. I've always wanted to accomplish this or solve this problem. Uh, what would it be? Oh man. Uh, I think we're working on it right now. Um, but mm. I, I just can't share it with you yet. I understand. Give me, Give me, give me, give me two months, and and I think I'll, I think I'll blow your guys' socks off. Well, I'm, I'm sure no one can wait. Uh, but, but something you mentioned before, like uh, part of your goal is making knives that you don't have to know. Peter Carey designed this, or uh, Jerry McGinnis designed this. Uh, just looking at that uh, McGinnis knife, I've been following someone on Instagram who, who. Um, collects him uh, for years, and every time I see one, I know who made it. Right. They all look different, uh, but they have a sort of uh, a sort of quality that that um, draws you in. I think the Monterey Bay knives have a very uh, um, visual first uh, impact. I mean, they obviously uh, they they seem to be very good tools. Uh, frankly, I, I don't have one and uh, haven't used one, but they look to be great knives. Um, but the visual impact first, they all look graceful. They all look beautiful. Uh, where, where do aesthetics, uh, fall for you in, in order of importance when you're settling or, or, or settling in on a design? It's, it's pretty top priority. It's, um, it's everything in the world has to have a cool factor. And, um, you know, it's, it's not just for, you know, putting a name on something, but it's gotta be visually just there or, or, you know, just, you know, don't do it. Um, you know, that's, 
you know, big reason why I think, you know, the Ray's knives do so well and look so good is, is the, they're just, people just get it. You know, you just look at it and you just get it. And if, and if I don't get it, then I don't want to do it. Yeah. So who, now who would you, um, who, who do you aspire to work with? Do you have any, any designers out there that you're, um, that you think would be a great fit with Monterey Bay? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people out there. There's, there's friends that I've talked to that we, we may or may not work in the future with. And, and, um, you know, everything is all about budgeting and, and timing. And, you know, cause at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing and, and they're doing what they're doing. And, and sometimes that these manufacturers and these, these, these designers, you know, may have something going on with somebody else. And the last thing I ever want to do is make them compete with themselves mm -hmm. and, um, or, or make it more difficult for me. So the timing has got to be perfect. You know, I would never ask someone or a designer, Hey, I'm going to launch this here. And they say, Oh man, I got a knife launching, you know, the week prior, you know, I, it's not good for them. It's not good for me. And so, you know, it's gotta be really, it's gotta be really good. It's gotta be good for everybody. Um, um, you know, I, I've got a lot of buddies in the knife industry and, and, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, I've, I've talked to, um, um, Elijah Isham. He's a, he's a, he and I talk almost daily, you know, it'd be fun to do something with him, but again, it's just all about timing and, you know, it's, um, you know, I've got a couple other designers and, and there's a couple just, uh, you know, nobody's ever heard of designers that I would love to work with, but it's, you know, it's, just, it's a balance. So. Well, you, uh, you speak of timing and, uh, dealing with, companies overseas how has um the pandemic and other uh, world calamities how, how have that how have those factors affected uh, monterey bay knives um that hit with um the xl excuse me the easy c 2.0 was delayed um the at least the second batch the uh, micarta ewcs which is um our, our kind of our slip joint friction folder double d tent knife that that got delayed big time. Um, and I, I apologize to my customer base that, cause I should have had this out months ago, but you know, here we are. Um, but I, uh, so I'd say probably set, I'd probably say it set everybody about a month and a half, two months back. Yeah. So, uh, is, is that another, um, uh, another little bit of flame under you to open your your shop and and uh, start making a few things here too. Do you think that would work uh, serve as any sort of stopgap, or is that more just a personal interest? Um, it'd probably be both. It's not it's not the defining factor, but it'd be it'd be nice to have the control of of um, you know it all being on my time and you know of course you know I run the shop too so. You know, if there were two of me, I could probably do this no problem. I, <laughs> right. I got, I gotta, I gotta figure that out. When it comes, I just, I'll figure that out, I guess. So uh, the XLC, I don't mean to be, keep coming back to my personal favorite knife, but that is an integral, right? That's a, uh, that's all milled. So how? And I think uh, is the EZC 2.0 also integral, or it or is I, yes. okay. All right. So how does that? I mean. You know, everyone knows how pleasing that is and how kind of desirable that is. But what kind of challenges does that present to you um, in in the manufacture process? Um, it's expensive and the maintenance is a little bit more troublesome. Um, I I'm very fluid about letting my customers uh, disassemble their knives and it's not going to break any warranties, but if it came to an integral, I, I would much rather them send it to me and allow me to do it just because it's, it can be, um, it's frustrating. You know, you'll, you'll get it back together. You'll get it rocking and rolling again, but, and, and dialed in, but it's, you know, I've done so many of them that I, I think I could, I, you know, I, I do it with my eyes closed, but it's, it is, it's troublesome. Um, um, if, if you don't really, I guess, know, know the, the intricacy of it, um, and, and, and it, limitations. And I would imagine it takes a bit of designing because it's a, a one piece instead of just, if people who are listening don't know in a grill, uh, instead of having two handles and a, and a backspacer, it's all milled out of one piece and you have to, 
uh, one piece of titanium and you have to fit all the works in there uh, without without having two halves that you can kind of easily put together. Uh, I would imagine as an owner, it would be uh, somewhat akin to opening up an automatic and being like, you know, not sure if you can get it back together until you do. And then, and then, right. so all of that extra titanium that gets milled out, can that be recaptured and used in my mind? I have this fantasy of, well, it's not really wasting it because you can take it and reuse it, but it's not like gold, is it? Um, no, I, you know, that's a good question. I need to ask, I should, I should ask my, the engineers overseas and see what they do with them. Um, I know, I mean, I, you know, I can't name names, but I've, I've done factory tours and I've seen what other people do. And, uh, I, I believe that they do it with aluminums. I, I can't see mm. why they wouldn't do, couldn't do it with titaniums. Um, but I, I would imagine, so I would imagine you'd, you'd probably see some recycle in there or, 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 you know, sell it back to someone who can use it for, I hope uh, you're you're right. I mean, I hate to see waste, so that'd be nice if it if it got absolved somewhere. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm sure it, I'm sure it ends up somewhere, but in my mind, it turns into another knife. <laughs> hey, I, <laughs> that'd be that'd be even cooler. So, uh, what what can smaller makers or or people embarking on on their own um, knife campaign of some sort or other, uh, what can they learn from the Monterey Bay knives uh, model in in your experience? um man uh go do it like i mean if you can find the right people to do it and you have the, the funding to do it and you have you know if you have the guts to do it go for it man i mean it's it's there the community is supportive if you're if you do your best and and you treat your customers well and um you know and and, and it's just such an ever-growing community that you know you i i don't i don't see i don't see why not um just expect a lot of, a lot of heartache and a lot of time mm -hmm. invested and a lot of, you know, you know, wipe and sweat from your brow and, you know, and, and, you know, quality controlling and I, you're going to go through band-aids cause you're going to QC everything and your fingers are going to get raw, <laughs> you know I mean? But do it for sure. Go for it. Well, uh, we've, we've had, uh, I say we, me and a, a number of online friends have had um, a number of prototypes come through our hands recently from a maker who was, um, he sent out three different stages of prototype for a knife he was, uh, uh, had a Kickstarter for, and each iteration of the knife was better than the, than the one before it. And they were all awesome. I, th I think they were all made by we, um, but uh just, I, I thought it was a great idea to to make these prototypes, uh, to have them made, and to have a, a number of different examples throughout the process, and then send them out, and yeah. and have uh, people get their hands on them. Do you have any sort of uh, prototyping process like that, or any sort of review or testing kind of process that you fall back on? Uh, we do. We do a few prototypes. We did. Um, we did a number of prototypes with the uh, with the sprocket. Um, you know, the, the very, very, very first sprocket prototype, we machined a certain way and, um, we machined a certain way. And, uh, originally Jerry said, Hey, you know, let's, there's a better way to do this. I said, okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's do it that way. And so we went and did a second, second variant and sent that out and he got, and he was much happier and, and pleased with the results. Um, and, um, I, I don't often send out a prototype because I, you know, is Sometimes they could be really ugly. Um, mm -hmm. And I, when I, and when I prototype, um, they're not perfect and you know what to expect once it hits full production. But, you know, if I, if I'm going to use M390 steel in the production, I'm not going to use M390 steel in the prototype. It just, there's no, no reason for it, you know? Well, so how does the three, you mentioned the 3d printer earlier, how does that help in your um, prototype in your design process? Um, holding it in hand and, and feeling, um, feeling the size, feeling the hot, the, the hot spots, you know, you, sometimes I'll, um, 3d print something and I'll sit at my computer watching a movie or something like that. And I'm, you know, I'm squeezing the knife and I'm rolling it back and forth. And, and eventually I'm going to wear a nice, my nice red spot in my palm and, and see what we can do about that. You know? Right. Right. Nowhere to, nowhere to knock it off a bit. So, uh, any, any Monterey Bay knives designed exclusively uh, by Sanford Owen in the works or, or, um, you know, Ray and I work so well together that, um, even if I design something, I'm still going to talk to Ray about it. Cause I mean, I talk to Ray every day and, 
and uh, and we think a lot alike. And so even if I design something that he's going to have his two cents, um, <laughs> Ray and I both designed a model called the old guard um, that'll be coming out. So kind of the same idea. It was, you know, Ray built the, 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 the prototype or the, the custom originally, but, you know, was hit him and I, you know, what do we want? How do we want it? What's it going to be like? How's it going to feel? What's, you know, and um, so it kind of came, it kind of, kind of came to light from, from a lot of both of our input. So, um, you know, we call that our, our in-house design, but, you know, I don't know, you know, one day maybe, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'll never stamp my name on, on, on the handle or anything. Of the blade. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a knife maker. I'm not, I, or at least not there, not, not that, not at that level. Right. I designed this me. Right. This one's mine. Right. This no, <laughs> no, no, thank you. I've got <laughs> So uh, yeah. what, what do we have? Uh, what's the future of Monterey Bay knives and, and where can people uh, find and, and, and get your, get your knives? Um, future. Uh, I just want to keep putting out cool stuff. I want to, you know, I want to release a model and then do another batch and another batch batch. And then I want to do a 2.0 version of it where it's different. And I want to do a smaller version. I, you know, I want to do all kinds of stuff. Um, you can find us on our website at montereybaynives.com and you can, uh, get on our Instagram page and our Facebook page, Monterey Bay Knives. Um, I'm really active on my Instagram page. If you send me a message, give me 15 minutes. I'm sure you'll get a message back. Um, you know, so, you know, it's, that's, that's where we're at, man. Well, to me, I hear, uh, I hear two, uh, two guys who love knives and who, um, know a lot about knives and can be nimble enough with your operation that you can respond to your own desires in, in what you want and what uh, the knife buying public, you know, the, the connoisseurs who are going after your knives want. So, I mean, to me, that, that kind of seems like a dream combination for most of us uh, knife nerds out there. I hope so. That's what we wanted to offer. (laughs) Well, Sanford Owen, uh, thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you.